Uh, hello, my name is Dmitry. I'm a Java developer for the last 10 years or so, and I've been doing Java and some JVM languages like Scala and Groovy. And so th this is talk about Kotlin programming language, and here we go. So if you want any slides, everything is here, including the code I will show. So if you, if you need it, I can tweet it later, you can take a photo, and you get everything I show is there already. It's a, it's a Dropbox link. It looks like Google, but it's Dropbox. So I assume you know what Java is, right? And the right hand says it's an island in Indonesia. So zooming in, it's quite a big island, really. And according to photos, ah, don't forget there is Java C, <laughs> Java Island. It's a clever pun. <laughs> And like Java Island, it looks pretty nice in photos. I've never been there, but if you, it looks like a good destination, like volcanoes, mountains. It's a bit far away, right? But then you know what Kotlin is now. Right? Uh, it is an island. <laughs> and it's like zooming in. It's not in Indonesia. It's near St. Petersburg. And it's quite small. But it's more realistic to visit, I guess. So, yeah. Well, in reality, Kotlin is a language for JVM. It's statically typed, like what they call pragmatic language for JVM and JavaScript. So what means statically typed, I think, is clear. Pragmatic means it's not experimental. It was created to be used in, on real projects and not to introduce completely crazy features. And it's officially targeting Java virtual machine and JavaScript. And this is, JavaScript is not beta, it's like officially supported. As you might know, it's like open source, developed by JetBrains. You can find it on GitHub, Apache 2 license, and so on. There aren't many contributors from outside of JetBrains, so it's basically de facto owned by JetBrains. Uh, this is code charm. So uh, vertical axis is amount of commits. Horizontal is time. So this is how many commits per month were made. So as you can see, this is, it's hard to see, but it's 2011, this is 2017, this amount of commits. So they released the first release last year, but it's not actually a new language, as you can see, because it started in 2011, so it's six years old already. So this is not a new language, and it was released just one year ago. And in a way, it's quite interesting, because to create JavaScript, it was just like a few weeks, according to some sources. And then it was released for Kotlin, it took like six years, and then it was released version one. So they took their time to get it right, I think. So recently, this year, there was Kotlin 1.1 with some additional features. So that's the case. In terms of amount of people who develop it, it's not that many. So again, this chart, vertical line is amount of people who make changes at least one change within a month, and uh, horizontal axis is time, so this is 2011, one, two person, and now it's, I guess it's about 20, but on, on, on Kotlin podcast they say it's about 30, so it's relatively small team for developing language. So as, as there was a question before, why not Java? So like in general, all this why not questions, if you're really happy with your technology, and everything works well for you, then obviously keep using it. So, so there must be like something you don't like. In terms of Java, I guess the biggest argument is that Java is a relatively old language and it's difficult to evolve. So I was at Java 1 and my interpretation of, there was a panel with architects of Java and there was a question, are there any plans to remove semicolons from Java? And my interpretation of the answer was, we technically could, but it's, we have other priorities, so it will never happen. So that, that's one example. Semicolons will stay in Java forever. In Kotlin, they're, they're optional already. So that's a silly example, but it gives you an idea how difficult to make changes in Java. So then why not Scala? That's the answer, most common answer, is because Scala has too many complex features, and it's now, uh, already causing problems on big projects because people <laughs> overuse these features, intentionally or not. And why not Groovy? It's the, the argument I heard, and I agree with it, is that for large scale projects, when you have 100 people working for 10 years and people leave projects, you need static types. So that's the biggest problem with Groovy. 
And like why Kotlin? It's supposed to solve all those problems. Plus it has additional features like nullable types, smart casting, and so on. So it has its own unique features which are not just addressing some problems. And I was going to, instead, instead of showing some slides and code, I wanted to show live coding to get people actual idea what it's like to program because usually when you get something in slides, it's one thing and when you start coding something yourself, it's a slightly different experience. So this is why I just wanted to do kind of hands-on thing. And because not many people feel free to interrupt at any point if you like do kind of more programming, if you want me to type something and see if it works or not, just feel free to interrupt. So I'll just move to actual coding. So th this is IntelliJ ID in presentation mode. This is why you don't see almost anything. And this is Hello World. To make it slightly bigger. I'm running it now, so just to see it still works. So yeah, it prints Hello World. You missed the comma. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fixed. A capital W as well, but I can't read it. Done, done. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, as you can guess, fun is a keyboard. It means it's function. Main is like in C, main function. Then you get arguments, which is uh, an argument. Uh, uh, unlike Java, you specify types after semicolon. Then you get array, which is which takes strings. So you get type arguments. And the return type of this function is unit, which is like void in Java. And it's optional, so I can skip it. Then we get like the body of the function and print align is, I can navigate to it. It's a function which is just system out print align, so it's like normal Java thing. Then we get string literal, obviously, and we call it. Um, so what we can do here is, for example, extract world into a variable, just to show, show some languages. This is, I did refactor and extract variables, so I extracted part of the string. What happens here now, we have val, which is, which means we define a value. It's a fi final variable in Java called message, and we sign string literal. Actual type here is string, so I can do specified type explicitly. So this means that Kotlin can do local type inference, so I don't have to do it. Here we have string interpolation, so the full syntax for it is this, dollar curly braces. When we have only one expression, we can skip it. In Java, it's this concatenation. So it's like a small thing, but it is helpful. Also in terms of string, since we here, if I specify type explicitly, it goes into string. And the interesting thing, what, what this string is, sorry. So if you can control click on it, we navigate to Kotlin source code and it's inside Kotlin string. So surprisingly, it's Kotlin.string. It's not Java string. So if I go and type, this is the actual type. However, if I look at bytecode for it, you can see, for example, in main signature, it becomes Java lang string. And this is one of the interesting things that at compile time, Kotlin has its own types, at least for some core types, but at runtime, it becomes it converted to platform type, so it becomes Java lang string. This is why it works really well, this interop with Java. So here we have println, which is actually Java println. And because of this conversion at compiled, after compile time, we can just use Java code. So this is hello world, and we can do change message, for example, hello acq. Now we get an error because val cannot be reassigned. So we can see what ID suggests, make vari variable mutable. So this, there is another keyword called var, so now we can change message. So I'll undo this bit, and now I'll try and extract the, this um, expression to function, yet another function. So function called greeting. Uh, so you can see now it's slightly different because the syntax is different, we don't have curly braces, it's just called equals, this is expression body, so I can convert it to the same format as main, and with curly braces, this is called block body. So if there is one expression in function, you can convert it to, exp convert it to expression body and optionally skip type, so this is like shortcut, but it's used quite a lot in Kotlin, so it makes sense, uh, it's useful to know about it. So the other feature which came from C Sharp in Kotlin, I think, is extension function. So here I can convert parameters to receive a refactoring, I'm gonna use it. And now 
what happens here is that first parameter which goes into function, we basically pretend that there is a function on string called greeting. And so syntax becomes message.greeting here. And inside the function we can refer to this and will, will be the first argument. At runtime, as you might guess, it becomes just a static function. So this is the greeting right now, and it's a final static which takes first argument. So in a way, it is similar to Py Python when it takes this as the first argument into every function. So I, I won't do it because it's not very useful. In terms of mutability, there is, again, you can say hello, accu, here, but val cannot be reassigned and val is argument. This is an interesting limitation in language, so you can never reassign parameters. There is no way to say var message here. It just doesn't work, so you cannot do it at all. In terms of extension functions, obviously, you can define them or like your own println, for example. So I can do this, println this, right? And then I can go and do println after greeting. So th this will still work. Um, other things, you can, unlike Java, you can have default parameters, so say view, and then we can skip message and it will print default value. So they're like small things, maybe more like Python, but really useful. Yet another thing, we can have named arguments, so now I can inline world and it will be just called named argument. So there is also interrupt with Java, so I have this class defined hello function and has greeting from Java, so I can do this print line and run Java code. So here, I'll navigate to this. This is just pure Java code. You can see because there is semicolon. So this is definitely Java, public static, and it just works and it prints hello Java. So interrupt is one of the things which was like one of the priorities in Kotlin. And in terms of how the whole thing works, it's similar to Scala groovy languages. So you can just specify, it integrates with existing build infrastructure. So you can specify in Maven or Gradle and it will just work. So if I go to Pom XML, so far I've been running it from ID, but the whole configuration can be pulled from this Maven definition. So all you need, if I collapse it, all you need is specify maybe some repositories but really all you need dependency on Kotlin as today library, and that's really it. And I mean, obviously plugin to build it. So it's basically this bit of XML and a little bit here, and that, that's it. And then you, you get hello world working. Yeah, just so it perfectly fits into Java infrastru infrastructure. One thing I forgot to mention, which is worth maybe mentioning is that functions as you can notice, this main was defined outside of class, unlike Java. And also functions can be defined anywhere. I just moved greeting inside main, so you can define nested functions. There's also package, like in Java, but unlike Java, you can ignore folder structure. You can define package with any name anywhere. So I just package ecu, but it's not folder ecu. It's the folder here is examples, so, and it's still happy. So this is hello world. It's quite intense. Do you want? Uh, you need the yeah. private in case of that. Is that private private? No, this is the interesting thing. So, in terms of uh, modifiers, it can be private, it can be internal, like C sharp. It's not package private. There is no package private, unlike Java. There is debate whether we want this feature or not, but it's not there. Internal, it's like you cannot use it outside this module. It's like basically C sharp feature. And by default, public. And this is surprising in a way because Kotlin been around for a long time and initially default was private. And they insisted on it because this is good for encapsulation and kind of makes sense. And then they changed their mind after analyzing code bases. And so in terms of saving characters, it's better to make default public. They analyzed Java code bases and realized we will force people to do the difficult thing. So there. this is how it works. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Well, 
Oh, yeah, yeah it will, well, you will have to import it explicitly. You won't get it unless you import it. Yeah, yeah, but you're right, yeah, it's available everywhere. And just to be clear, I showed it's public static. It means there is no polymorphism in it at all. So it's not like Scala implicit. So you cannot do type classes with this. Uh, extension function. This thing. Well, I mean, if you find a simple function that conflicts with a normal function on that file. Or yeah, that's an interesting question. I would think it should pick up like a local first. That's what I would say. We can try. If you want. So oh, one more yeah. print to land, right? <laughs> so, and this print to land will be this, right? Uh, no, no. I mean, this. Uh, is it good? Should I try? Does make sense? I, oh, you, you can already see an ID. It already says this one is never used, so it picks like the, in terms of scoping, it picks the local one. I mean, it seems like, you know, the string will have, um, you know, uh, concatenate or replace or find. So it messes with making the instance on that file. I think it will pick local. We can try if you want to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, to tell me what to type. <laughs> Uh, so a method already been on the string type. Okay. Built-in string method. Create an extension method with exactly the same signature. What do we want? Uh, uh, yeah, chars. Right, let's script chars. Right. Yeah, what, Fun stream chars. And then it will return empty string, let's say. And then we get chris.chars. Oh, no, it picks up Java one, I think. So yeah, in this case, it doesn't pick up this one. It, 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 it warns you that it's shadowed by oh, Java. I think you'll get a warning rather than that. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Oh, that's, I didn't. Just to say, sorry, logically, they don't want to let you put strings that you want to override it. That's not the problem. That's the concept of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll move on if you don't mind. So, this was Hello World. This is what we looked at basic syntax, string abstraction, val versus var named parameters, extension functions, integration with Java. So, because it was intense, here is a joke. So, this settles debate, what came first, chicken or egg? And there is always correct technical answer. Eggs were before chicken existed with uh, lizards and so on, so eggs come first. Now, moving to the next, like it was very intense color world, now moving to intense pictorial. So, obviously, just in case pictorial is when you, like, yeah, yeah, this Wikipedia entry, I assume everyone knows. If you don't know, ask. So move into factorial demo. So this is factorial definition function here. So it's recursive, not necessarily efficient. So similar to previous, so fun is a keyword. This factorial function takes n as an argument and returns int as a like, result. If n is less than one, we return one. Otherwise, we recursively return factorial for number, like pre before multiplied by n. Is it clear to everyone? Implementation, yeah. So what we can do, like in Kotlin, everything is expression. So first thing we can do, can lift return out of if statement. So now we return if. There is also a construction, which is like Java case, but it doesn't exist in Java called when. So here we say when, and this, this is a condition, this is default value and this arrow means like what will happen in this case. In this particular case, I don't like this, so I'll undo it and I'll just join these lines like this. Maybe a little bit verbose. We could try here, convert to expression body like before, but it's also, I, I don't like it. I think this is a bit more readable. So obviously the tutorial, again, okay, I need to run it to make sure it still works. So here the question is like, uh, how does it actually work? So we looked at print LN, and so if I go to like say print 17, this is, factorial grows really fast, so this is the first test you want to try bigger numbers, and obviously goes to minus, which is definitely wrong. So we want to know what is int, because this is not exactly like Java, and you can control click, and this is, uh, again, we're now back to Kotlin source code, and this is a class defined in in, in Kotlin source code, and it says represent the two bit integer on JVM. It just represents as primitive type int. For people who don't know JVM, type int has silent overflow, 
it's, it's not very big, so it silent, silently goes round to negative numbers, and th th this is what happens, basically. So, it, again, it's a similar trick, so at compile time, this type is Kotlin, dot int and the run time is transformed into platform type. So for JVM it's lowercase int. So there is like an obvious fix to it could be to int to change it to long, for example. We, we kind of know that, I, I, I know that it will overflow still, but we, we can just try it and see how it goes. And j th then find proper solution later. So I'm changing here all the number literal is to L, it means to make it long, so I can change type now here, and return type, and everything just works. So, it's worth mentioning here, so I'll, I'll run it again, and we'll see the result if it helps. It does help, that's good. So, the 17 works now. Um, so, the, the interesting thing here is, although long and int, they were represented uh, by Kotlin uh, classes, so means there are no primitives. So all of these lons and ins, they're actual classes in Kotlin. And also they all, all comparison operators, like compare to and minus, they're actual operators on objects. So these are not built in into language. These are actual functions defined on some objects. And here you can notice this is again definition of minus test operator. So we basically have lon dot minus int. So there is, if I expand the syntax for it, for, for the minus, so you can replace overload right of function call, so it becomes n minus one, and the same with comparison and so on. So this is another maybe lesson Kotlin did, uh, learned from Java as, as well as Scala and Groovy that il basically eliminating primitive types. So everything is an object in Kotlin. So this is, this is good, but if you want to now, the obvious solution to this, if we go to the example 30, it will still break, even for long. So the obvious solution is go to big decimal. And this kind of becomes now complex, so we probably should have been writing unit tests in the first place. So I'll, I'll, do, I'll do, move our code into unit tests. So I'll, I'll define a class, Victorial tests. Here the interesting thing is that there is an argument that maybe everyone is wrong and we should call our test classes, not just tests, but tests as plural, because there are multiple tests inside those classes. And all the frameworks like Maven, they just run. <laughs> That's an interesting argument, but there you go. Yeah. One of the things that we use is like, why can't they use Java? It's like long integers, right? Well, I guess the, there are reasons in terms of design, like in Scala. You, you want to be able to have just one type system, not this weird int, which is, is it, is lowercase int in Java an object? Like, it's not. So, and this, like, breaks your type system in a certain way. Okay, but do they have in the type, like, int, long, long? At runtime, they become Java lowercase ints and longs. So, it's equivalent to Java lowercase in most cases. But then you don't have this boxing, unboxing, so compiler decides this for you. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah. Oh, okay. So, here I can do Create so if I calculate factorial. So here, what's going on? So I defined a class. This is like Java syntax, then curly braces. Here, test, as you can see, import from JUnit. So this is just normal JUnit code. So I navigate it to interface in JUnit. It's, it's just Java annotation. Then we define fun. And in Vectix, we define function name. This is like a, an interesting thing, which also most languages like Scala and Groovy did, that you can now define absolutely any name with, um, you're not restricted to um, normal identifiers. So with certain syntax, you can define absolutely any name with spaces or reserved keywords in a language. So backticks and then you basically, almost any string is, is allowed. So it's especially useful for tests. So you can see it's normal method, it has auto-completion and so on. So I'll move Victorial outside of main because this was a hack anyway. Then I can move all printer lands out. And here we probably don't want, well, in theory, that, that's another thing. There's lots of people, they 
if they want to run some code, they don't create main methods, they just create classes because you see now I ran this test and it was equivalent to main. So you, you, you want, if you want main, you can just start class. So, so now I'm changing this to assertion so that we have some kind of assertion equals two, let's say one. And so here is a question of what we want to import. There is Hamcrest, which is plain Java Hamcrest, and there is Hamcrest for Kotlin. There are like subtle differences, but here it doesn't matter. So just to show that integration with Java works, I'll use normal Java Hamcrest. So here you go. Uh, need to choose this the right one. No, I didn't choose the right one. So what's, what's going on here? Oh, I think it complains about that, yes. Just wants, Hamcrest is strongly typed, so definitely wants to have types matching. So, so now, now, it's, now it should be happy. So, and I can copy results. It was one, one, two, six, 24, 120, this number. And then something we don't even know what it is. But, so I'll run it again to see that it fails on the right line. Yes, it, it fails on this line. So oh, here's obvious answer to use big decimal. As, as you can probably guess, oops, what did I do? We should be able just to use Java big decimal. So I'll do, I'll try to do this quickly. So change big decimal. Maybe it's better to do it here. Again, changing in column mode. So th this is why I can edit the whole thing. And it should be equal to big decimal. Kind of goes off screen slightly. But here it was. So now it complains that big decimal uh, signature is wrong, I think. So now, uh, yeah. So what I did, I changed big decimal here. And this is slightly also a new thing in Kotlin, unlike a few languages that, here big decimal is normal Java math big decimal. And this is just normal constructor. The difference is that there is no new keyword. So you can use class name as a constructor. And just they got rid of new keyword. I think, I, I like it personally. I think it's, it was a good decision. And so now the, the only thing here is that we, cannot use string literals as big decimal. So we need to use it like this one big decimal and, and so on. So I'm changing it here. So I'd finally I'm running it and we should get some results. So yeah, it's some, some big number. It's bigger than literal, so I'll put it as a string. So it's like finally the test should pass. Yeah, so now, now it works. So the, the interesting thing, it was a bit frustrating that I had to change this one literal to some constant. So in theory, we could just do this. And it's like not in theory, we can just write extension function. Here I can define it like this. And so I can do n. What, what's going on here? I define operator. Uh, I define a function, extension function on big decimal called compare to int. And what, what I want is to return this compare and then I wrap integer into big decimal and then I'll convert it to expression function. And here you go, it just works uh, as if it was built in thing. So we can do the same thing with minus, for example. So here, uh, yes, we get an error, we can use extension, define. The, the key thing is that there is keyword operator. So there is operator, op overloading in Kotlin. So if I remove operator, uh, Kotlin starts complaining that you need an operator. So this is full syntax once again. This is the actual call. And we, we can also use keyword called infix. Then we can convert it to this syntax when n minus one. We don't need dot and parentheses. It's like another syntactic sugar. And I don't think there is massive agreement where to use it. I think it's like nice tools, but you should know when to use it. So if you thought this is it, you were wrong, because obviously if you go to like 30,000, you will get, guess what? Stack Overflow, of course, yeah. So there is uh, 
a way to fix it in Kotlin, and this is called, there is keyword for it, tail recursion. It's, it's not going to happen by default. You have to specify it explicitly, and I think it's a good thing because if you do it and if you expect tail call optimization to happen, then you, but your code is not tail recursive. You might not get it and you will never know. But if you explicitly say your intention, then compiler can help you. So this is what happens here. This code is not tail recursive. So it should, be, should have been an error, I think, but here is just a warning. So what we need to do is like, I'll quickly rewrite it to tail recursive version. So it's like result, it returns big decimal, starts with one. So if, it, if n is less than one, we return result. Otherwise, we'll do a tail recursive call with result multiplied by n. I think this should be fine. We'll see soon. So all, all, what it means is that tail recursive call, yeah, it did work. We got some number back, really low number. You see scrolling for a long time. But it, it, it ran in half a second, so it's good. So yeah, so what happens here is that the last call of the the last call in the function should be the function itself. And previously it was multiplication. Anyway, there is tail call optimization. To make things even more confusing if it wasn't enough, there is such thing. Great interview question if you want someone to fail to ask and write, this is factorial and it's written in a recursive way. And there is core recursion thing. I heard about recursion for years, but I never heard about core recursion until recently. It's not a complex thing, it's just like yield in C sharp. But this is called core recursion. It's actual mathematical term. It looks something like this. So th this is, I'm not going to explain it, but uh, all I want to point out, there is yield thing in Kotlin. This uh, was released this year. It's still experimental feature with core routines. And it brings you uh, generators and in general, just core routines to Kotlin. The interesting thing is that it's done in a more generic way. So, uh, like they pushed keywords down one more level down compared to C sharp where you have like keywords here keywords like hidden and yield is just a function in a library so this is like, an interesting thing but I'm not going to go into it so yeah yeah that that's it anything you want me to type yeah I haven't tried. It's a good question. Never tried. So I would argue this time. Maybe it becomes a bit complex. What about three levels? Or what if objects and they are on different threads? <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. This is like this is what I've seen in enterprise code. <laughs> so I thought, oh, well, okay. If you have several levels, I, I would try, but it will take some time. So I, I'll do it later. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll move back to slides. This was factorial. So what we learned is that there is int and long that just like strings, it's an abstraction. Uh, all numbers are object, no new keyword, operator overloading, tail call optimization. This is the thing with tail rack. And I showed unit testing, which is basically Java unit testing. Thing I didn't mention is that why it worked in ID. There is no special plugin because Kotlin compiles to normal Java code. So plugins for JUnit, they can just pick up class files and just run it straight away. So there is no special support for it. It's just normal Java. So it will integrate with all tools. So because it was intense, here is a joke. Yeah. The, there are certain like a group of classes which are core classes, and they're ported to like all platforms that, that want to support. I don't think Big Decimal one of them. So I'm not 100% sure, but I suspect it's not. Because I think all the classes which are cross-platform, they're in Kotlin, and there is this abstraction. And big decimal it was java.math.bigdecimal. So I think no. Yeah, so this is joke about optimism. So now like the, the next example is more realistic finally, because what we looked at like hello world just is basically strings. Factorial is just basically numbers. So now finally we move into enterprise when we have strings and files. <laughs> because all enterprise is about XML really. There is no XML here, but ideally it should have been XML and network maybe. So this is data mining cutter. Um, the cutter, in, uh, the, this cutter was popularized by D Dave Thomas, who wrote this book, Pragmatic Programmer, if you haven't seen this great book. 
It's quite old, but it's still worth reading, I think. So that's uh, code kata in general is an exercise. Kata is a Japanese term, which means repeating the same movement again and again till you make it, till you learn how to do it really well. So just a way to practice. This is the website, current website by Dev Thomas. It used to look more serious than this <laughs> without cats, but. There you go. And the, there are a bunch of cutters here on this website, but if you just Google for it, you'll find more. So the, this code cutter is one of the cutters. And it goes like this, data munging cutter number four. So there are three parts to this cutter. And the first part is about reading data file with records about weather and finding day with minimum temperature spread. The second part is to do a similar thing, read text file with football team results. You see soccer. Yeah. No, it's football team results and <laughs> find team with minimum goal difference. And third part is refactor it to make it minimal, to make code dry. So that's, that's the thing. So I'll move to code now, data munching cutter. So here what we have again, main method. What's going on here, we have file, which which is Java IO file, as you can see. Again, it's saying no new keyword, and it's just normal Java code. So we get this file, then we do read lines, and for reach line, we do println. So to go a bit in more details, what's going on here, is you might guess read lines is IO operation, but there are no exceptions defined anywhere. So in Java, you would have throws something. The, the reason is that in Kotlin, there are no checked exceptions. So everything is not checked exception. This is why there is no exception to find. So as you can guess, these are lines. If I extract this as a variable against type inference, as I specify type explicitly, we get a list of strings. As you can probably guess by now, if I navigate to list, we go into Kotlin list. And if I look at this at runtime, it will be Java util list, really. So I navigate back to uh, Kotlin source code. So here we see public interface list. This is type parameter. And you can see here out, which is, if you, I'll touch it quickly, but I won't explain in details. This means it will be covariant. And you can also do a contravariant. So unlike in Java, when you define variance, contravariance, you use it at use site. So in the code where you use your generalized, generic collections, you specify variance. And for example, in Scala, you do it in class definition. In Kotlin, you do, can do both. That's the thing. You can have mixed site and declaration variants. So just mentioned it for people who understand. Otherwise, just it's like separate deep subject. So if I collapse or, or maybe look at this view here. So we can see in Kotlin, there are collections very similar to Java. So there are like iterable collection list map and as you can guess, map doesn't extend collection. So it's like reflection of Java collections, except that you also get mutable, immutable collections. So by default, lists, they are read-only. And then there are separate interfaces for mutable uh, collections. The, the trick is that read-only means read-only. They're not persistent. If you know like Haskell or something, the collection which reuses memory. This one is like every time you modify your collection, it just creates new array lists. So it's not necessarily very efficient. But you, yeah, so that's, that's the idea. So here is collection hierarchy. So green ones are read-only one. And the green, green hierarchy is Kotlin read-only interfaces. This yellowish ones, it's mutable interface, and then at the bottom you see some Java things. But Java collections that don't appear until runtime. So this is what's going on here with lines. So it's basically just, it becomes Java list after we read lines from file. Then there is a bit more, then read lines, as you can guess, I can navigate its extension function on file. So it's obviously in Java there is no read lines. So we get it here. For, from Kotlin library. There are lots of util functions in Kotlin. So now after we get lines as a list, we can do a dot for each. And here we get this thing which looks like some uh, language contraction, but it, it's not. So I can do, th this is lambda, curly braces lambda, and I can make it more explicit what's going on. So for each is a function which takes lambda as an argument. So this is the actual syntax. And then in Lambda can specify its input type explicitly. So this is it. 
is by default default name for an argument in a lambda. If there is just one argument, it's called it. The, this is convention coming from Groovy, I think, because in, it's the same thing as Groovy in Scala, it's underscore, if you're familiar with Scala. So I'll, I'll change it back to what it was to just curly braces. So in terms of, for each, again, it's extension function, I'll navigate to it. So it's defined on iterable, and for each, it takes one argument, this action, and it has type, this uh, type, which means a lambda, which takes a T, and then it returns units. So unit is like void, so it like returns nothing. And here we do just normal println. So if I run it, we, we can see what's going on finally, the, to see the actual file. Uh, yeah, this is wrapping lines. So this is what we get. This is the actual content finally of the file. So what we want, really, the, back to Kata, what we want is to maybe extract, my, my suggestion is to extract all these three columns. This is day, this is maximum temperature. This is minimum temperature. So we probably want to extract this into some variable, this column and third column, and do the difference between maximum and minimum, and then find day. So that, that's the whole idea. So. So we get quite a few lines here. So it, it, as you can see, it's like file is the typical enterprise uh, data. It starts with some rubbish. So it's like, what is this? I don't know at the top. I, I literally don't know what this is. So then we get header. So then we have something at the end, which looks like a little bit like uh, HTML. So, but I don't know what this is. So I'll, I'll do what enterprise developers do. I'll just drop things randomly. So, uh, Read lines, then we can do drop. I'll drop eight lines because I just remember how many, and then I take 30. So now we, we will get just the actual data. So yeah, here you go, it kind of worked. I think it worked. Then what we want is probably convert it into something. So I'll do list of, and of the first argument, uh, should be maybe, now, what we want is split in the first place. So we can do split and do, for example, like regex, like what you would do in Java space and plus. Right? And the interesting thing is that it's not gonna work, I think, because yeah, it didn't work. As you can see, it didn't. So collections, they like in square brackets. So here we get, it didn't really split because this takes a string, not regex. This is one of the things they fixed really in Kotlin Java because in Java you could pass a string and under the hood it will create regular expression which takes time and it's not obvious what's going on. So here it's very explicit. If you pass a string, it will use a string or you pass regex, it's regex. So now if I do this, it will actually split column by column. Yeah, now you see lots of commas, so it's definitely split. And we get these three columns we want. The only problem we have star, so I'll just replace it. As an enterprise developer, I'll do replace star with just nothing, and just to make it work, right? And then we want to convert it to some data structure. This is literally how many things work when you look at kind of like why did why this happens? Like I don't know. So we, there are no tuples in Kotlin, so you, you can lose a list for it. So now I'm trying to do is to create a list with the columns we need. So it's like the first column, then you can do the second column and try to convert it to int because we'll later on, we'll want to use it as an int. So maybe better formatting will help. Okay. And then what I expect is to see fewer columns here. So now if I run it again, we'll see fewer columns. So yeah, it's just the three columns we want. The, the, another interesting thing about Kotlin, because as I showed, it, it existed for quite a while, and there were tuples in Kotlin, and before releasing version one, they decided to remove them, because it was, the idea was to release the minimum set of language, because once you put something in public, you cannot change it, or it's very difficult, so they just, they're not saying no to uh, tuples, they just say, not now. That's the idea, is to minimize the surface of the language. Makes it so. Currently, the answer is to use data classes. And pre yeah. yes. Uh, yes. Yes. It's like Java. What one string and two ints? Yes. 
No. Yes, yes. Yeah. Here again, like list of is a function defined in Kotlin as the helper function. There are no literals, at least for now, for uh, lists. So you cannot define literal. This is like feature which is coming, I believe, at some point, but it's not there yet. Yes, that, that, that's the argument. It's similar to Groovy, as far as I know. There are no tuples in Groovy for the same reason, so you can use array. <laughs> so. And so the, currently the answer is that we don't really want to do it because you should use semantically richer constructions, which is a data class. Data class, I'll do it here. It will be, for example, day, day entry. And then we can, this is similar to Scala case classes. So I'll, I'll just write code and I'll explain what, what it is. So it's a class which is like a struct in C or value object, if you like. It's a class which will have day as a string, maximum as an integer, and minimum value. So the, these are the things we have here. So what's going on here is just a normal class which contains three fields, day, max, and min. And the additional thing what happens, it will have get to string method, it will get equality, it will be able to be deconstructed, it will have copy, um, copy method on it. So it's like those additional generated thing. And it's here I defiled, defined it as well, so these are final variables, so it's a mutable class. And hopefully you should do the drop-in replacement. So instead of list, I can use data. This is the argument, like why even bother with uh, string uh, tuples? So here you go, you can see the, the, this worked. So now like the actual answer to the, to the um, cutter is to find day with minimum uh, temperature spread. So there is a built-in function mean by which, for which we can do, which we can use here and we can say mean by difference of the current day. And I cannot use for each anymore because it will be one entry. So I'll use function which I have a pre wrote before in advance called dot printed, which is defined like this, is basically just prints the current value and returns it. So that's the, the gist of it, it's extension function. So if I run it again, we should get the answer finally. And yeah, I, I know the answer is 14, not 42. And it looks right, so th this is like, this was the part one. Because the part two is football file, looks a little bit similar. You can guess again some enterprise thing at the top. Then slightly different data. This is the columns we want to extract and so on. I'm not really gonna do it, I'm gonna cheese. So I'll ju just paste in prepared code from, from elsewhere. So just to show the code, this is team entry here, which is like very similar to what we had. Uh, just remember, we're not at the dry part, so this is just duplication. And then similar code with football file, opening file, drop couple lines, filter this line, because there is this line. There's again, more enterprise code contains this. Again, please create sim entry, and mean by mathabs goals difference, and then print it. So if I run it, we should get Aston Villa, I think. Yeah. So it's the middle, so it kind of works. So th this is the cut. Again, it's like we're not doing it right, so we should write a test. Should have been writing tests. So that data mining cutter tests. And here I'll use different, different framework stream, different framework. Previously it was just Java JUnit Classic One. This is a testing framework written for Kotlin. It's called uh, Kotlin test. So here, what, what's going on, I have class, define this the name, and this column means extends in Java, so this, this class extends string spec, which is part of Kotlin test spec, string spec. So here, I'll call init. Init is just some code which will be run after main constructor of the class. And here, this is like the interesting bit. I'll just write code and explain what it's doing. So I'm defining a test which is called find day with with mean temperature spread. This is what the first cutter was about. So I can move this code there. And then what we want to find football team, find football team with mean goal difference.
And again, I'm, I'm just moving code from main method. Maybe it looks, is it still readable? Hopefully, I'm just minimize font. So now we have both of these here. If I run it again, we should just see printed result once again. So what's going on here is that we extend this string spec. So yeah, it still works, it still shows up in um, ID. So string spec, it's a class defined in framework, it extends test base, and it has runner with, so uh, has run with annotation. So this is why it integrates with the whole infrastructure of IntelliJ and it just works. Again, it's like similar story, it just will work with any Java tool. Uh, natively. So the, the interesting bit is this bit, why we have this like string and then it can take something. This is again operator overloading. What's actually going on here is we can specify, replace overloaded operator with function call. And what's going on here is dot invoke. And this is extension method on a string. And then it takes a closure, which is actually all this bit is just a closure in a string. And if we go to string spec, this is what's going on. There's extension method. Uh, on stream called invoke, and when it's converts to zone operator, it's like uh, parentheses, and the last argument is a closure, so we can skip parentheses and so on. So this is just uh, operation overloading on the stream, what's going on here. And then the framework does its magic, so we, we can do assertions. So what, what's, so ne next thing we want to do is to do assertions, really. So I'll extract this whole bit into day entry and we probably want to assert in day entry and say that it should equal, let's say, to itself. So I'll copy output just to make sure. So now we can see this is day entry, it equals to. So similar thing we can do with football team. Uh, extracting football team, team entry. And again, copy and team from here. Yeah, well, at least it proves it works. <laughs> so it's a useful thing to do. So now, now we have this refactored, like put into Unicef, so we can go and do dry part, part three. So the, the thing which, which is not perfect about this, we have this entry but it's kind of over-specified, arguably, for tests. So we, we, spe we assert on the whole entry, but we probably, what the name of the test says, find day, so we probably want to say day should equal 14, really. It's like the right thing. And here we bump into this feature of nullability. So like compiler complains now, it says only save or inserted calls allowed. So it's, it's a bit confusing. So if I specify type explicitly, this like if you bump into compiler errors with, in Kotlin or any other uh, language with interesting type system, you, like the first thing to spe is to specify types explicitly everywhere. It's like the same rule for Haskell. So here, if I go and specify date entry, what is the type? You can see the type is date entry question mark. And this is like the interesting thing is that in Kotlin, there are two parallel type hierarchies in a way. Oh, no, they're not really parallel, but there is like the, the whole type hierarchy is reflected for nullable and non-nullable. So when I define day entry without question mark, it cannot be, can never be null. So a anything that can be null has to be defined with question mark. And the reason it happens here, so if I delete question mark, then IntelliJ complains about mean by, and the reason is that if you have an empty list and you try to find minimal element, what do you get back? It's like, no. And th this is why type system forces you to specify it every way explicitly. So we can look and see what IntelliJ suggests. It says surround with null check. This is another feature. So it surrounds with null check. And here it just knows that the entry is not null because it's a final variable. You can guarantee that you did check for it and on the next line it won't be. So another feature can be used in more complex cases, smart type casting. So when compiler can infer certain things about your program because of immutability. So it's kind of trying to be smart. If you do, yeah, if you don't, you, do, you need to do fewer casts in Kotlin because of this. So th this is one background which is not very nice. Another one you can do bang bang dot, which means 
I definitely know it's not now. Even though type system says it's now, well, I guarantee. And if it's not true, it will throw a null pointer. It's just like forcing type system to do something. And maybe at least an intrusive way is also very similar to Groovy is the question mark dot. It means if data entry is null, then the whole expression is null. So this is probably what we want to do. Uh, I'll run it again and it should pass and we should do the same thing here. I suppose 15, yeah, this worked. And then team name, Aston Villa. So the, the, the whole point of this exercise is to make your test less brittle. So if the rest of data changes, it, your code will still work. If this was slightly confusing. I think there is a good resource on type system of Kotlin and like this nullability is like net price. He wrote a blog post and we can quickly take a look. And this is like the actual web page from NetPrice's blog post. So mistakes I've made. So this is Kotlin type hierarchy. So I'll, I'll just quickly skim it. So there is a, no object in Kotlin. It's called any. It's kind of similar to Scala. So string int, they inherit from any. And then so you can define a class fruit. And it by default inherits from any. You can define more classes, like make fruit abstract here. And you can inherit from abstract and so on, then you can do multiple inheritance from interfaces, just like in Java, but only what, um, you cannot inherit from multiple classes. So it's very similar to Java. It, it, was, uh, it, it was considered by Kotlin team, but it's, it's not there and probably not gonna happen because, uh, unless there are good reasons to do it, obviously. So moving on, nullable types, this is what I was talking about. I'll, I'll skip all this example. So this is what I was talking about is to like, reflected hierarchy. So you have any fruit, banana, and then you have hierarchy with question mark, which are nullable types. And normal types, they are subtypes of the same type with question mark. So if something is nullable, you can use your non-nullable thing. Anyway, so this is like the whole hierarchy. Another thing I mentioned is unit, which is like the only, there is only one, one instance of unit, which is like void. And there is nothing which is similar to Scott, the bottom of type hierarchy. It's a subtype of all types. And putting everything together, this big thing, yes, this is it. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it. It looks more scary than it is. But the, the good thing about it is that it's somewhat consistent type system because everything fits into few rules and they all fit together, unlike Java with lowercase int and so on. So this was a quick tour of type system. If your code didn't fit, is that the first thing you mean? If, if, if your code hasn't fit, so what, what? You mean here, so if I remove this with now, ah, oh, no, it needs to be specified type export. I don't know, it's okay. So you mean replace all this with null? Will it be reported? Yeah, so this whole expression will become null. Uh, it will be an error, I believe. So what we can do, we can like delete all the data from here. So th th this is running now, right? We can remove all, um, all lines from weather file and see what happens. So I'll remove everything, run it again. So it blows up, it says null didn't equal 14. So I'll do. So the, the third bit of the, the whole exercise was to make it dry. And maybe the first naive thing you would think, like there is a bit of duplication. Cannot we do something like this, like data class entry? And it will have common data, let's say day, no, no, key will be string. And then we will inherit from it and say entry. So now we get errors like this type is final. So what I did is just make entry open. So this is the interesting thing about Kotlin, which is somewhat unusual decision that all classes by default are final. So if you want a class to inherit from anything or any method, you have to define it as open. So this is what it complains about. But then you get, we get to the next error when Modify open isn't compatible with data modifier. So there are, I won't go into details why it happens, but basically IntelliJ just suggests things which, which are not correct. So we could try remove this and then pass day in, but then I have the question, what is the point of this whole exercise? In reality, to generalize, I found this 
it's better to just define interface, like entry as an interface, and put values into interface, so something like this. So we can have key and criteria, which is int, and it will be comparable. So the idea is that we can minimize by criteria defined in this interface, and then use key to like, have um, abstraction to identify day and t. So here, what I'm gonna do is define key as day, and criteria as max minus min. So you can see keyword override here. This is keyword, it has the same meaning as override in Java, but it's mandatory. So this is another lesson from Java, which all languages post, post create adapter Java learned that override should be mandatory. So similar I can do, similar thing I can do with team entry. So I can inherit from this interface and say keys will be team name ah, and criteria will be math apps, go for, go against. So now hopefully we can just use our new interface instead. So what I can do instead of mean by this, I can do mean by criteria and I can do not day but key. The same here. Ah, uh, no, mean by criteria. So hopefully it still works, environment test. So yeah, it does work. So the next thing, obviously the, this code is somewhat similar, but it's not exactly the same because we drop different amount of lines, do this, all these things. So the, one of the ideas I found is that just ignore lines which we cannot parse. And for this I wrote a function which is with null on exception. So it means, so what's going on here, this function is defined in some other class and the definition is like function which takes t, this is type parameter into function, it takes an argument f which takes a which is a closure which basically any code and it returns t inside it calls function f and if any exception happens it just returns null instead as you can see here try catch is like if else also an expression so we can return try catch so because this f is the last argument here we can drop parentheses so this is the actual syntax with parentheses but if you drop parentheses, it looks like some statement. So here we bump into another problem is that when we map, then it becomes nullable. So we can map and convert to not null. So it, there is another built-in function map. And if your return value is, and filter out nulls basically, map filter out nulls. So if we do this, it, we can hopefully drop all of this stuff and we don't need to replace. So any line which fails, it will be just converted to null and then thrown away. So th this bit still works and the same thing for team entry. Uh, null on, what was it, with null on it. So the, 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 this is how you define in Kotlin higher order functions with null on exception is a higher order function. So I can remove this and it should still work. Ah, it should be map not null. Now it will work. So now code is much more similar between these two cases. So we can hopefully extract it into something similar. So I'll do extract this whole code into find min entry. So I go to definition, I can, I'm extracting file name as a parameter and call file name. So it will be generic. We also want to extract this as a function because this is now the only specific thing. So we'll pass it, we'll, the idea is to pass creation of entry as a parameter and it will create, return this generic interface. So extract a function, create day entry here. So if I go to navigate to day entry, it takes a list, I'll say values, and returns, should return entry. And here we should also return entry and in the end we should, what we have right now, we have this find min entry, but it's still very specific. 
So we want to pull out create day, day entry as a function here as a parameter. It's like this small screen is a bit confusing. So I'm not sure about formatting. I'll try this formatting and see if it makes sense. So what we want, we want to have some create entry function, which it takes a list of strings and returns an entry. This will be a, a lambda. And then we call it here and we're done. So now code breaks over here because we have the first parameter file name, we want to have some lambda. There is a way to do something like that. Create day entry and pass in it. Here it will be just all the lines we read from the file above. There is a shorter syntax uh, to do just this. This is a reference. Well, it complains for some reason. Maybe you should move it out of the class. Yeah. So this is a syntax, syntax just passing a reference to a function instead of specifying this lambda. So now it was quite a bit of changes. So if I run code now, it should hopefully work. It still works, surprisingly. And if we look at this find min entry, it's now very generic. So we can just plug in football thing as soon as we extract this team entry thing. So like create team entry function, which will take values here and it will return just entry and not team entry. So now all this code should be replaceable with our function. was fine, oh, create team entry. And all of this can go away, hopefully. What I'm doing here, I'm moving code outside of class. Uh, it's maybe not obvious, but it doesn't matter, really. So what, was what we have now, we have class and all the functions defined outside of this class, just in file. And so here we go, this is all refactored to one function. So if I run it again, it should be like done. Yeah, so it still works, so this is dry now. Uh, there are simpler ways to do it. It's like the, the best solution for this cutter I've seen is that it says this, like if you read the definition of it, it says print out an entry with minimum temperature difference. So the obvious solution, we've already done it in the very beginning, printing all lines, because all lines, they already include minimum entry by definition. So <laughs> it's just this is the actual, the fastest solution. Yeah. And it's correct, and you cannot argue, yes. Is that entry left? Is that the uh, what do you mean? So, yes, yes. So it's throwing them away. So it's, yeah, you're right. It's, it's not correct. Yeah, so it won't be correct though. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Because, like, yeah, it's because there is no minimum entry with asterisks. So, yeah. This must be wrong. Thanks. So, yeah, I, hopefully it made some sense at least. So. Anything else you want me to try? So what was the, um, you allowed the parentheses on should equal and with not exception. What the thing that allowed you to allow the parentheses in that case? Is it not like the obvious choice? Should, should equals. Yeah, so how did you, what, why did it allow you to allow the parentheses down there? Uh, because it has modify infix. So oh, we, the infix modify. Yeah, it's, yeah, so it wasn't obvious. It's also defined in string spec. Uh, yeah, you mentioned so earlier, I couldn't which of the two oh. words was the thing that yeah, well, yeah, thanks. It's, it's not obvious. Yeah. So, yeah. The other thing is the int function, do they get called after the constructor? Yeah. Do yeah. you use that on anything that comes to the system? Yes, it's language feature. It would be nice from this framework point of view to move it out of init, but you cannot do it. Yes. Oh, great. Is there any particular reason? I mean, it's a bit of an odd thing adding a special thing rather than just saying it's put it in the constructor. Do you know why? Because it's just a surprise. Well, 
Wow. Well, m m my guess is that like it's all about integrating with J unit infrastructure. So you, if you have a class which is a unit contains unit tests, it will be instantiated at some point. And if you put something into constructor which will run your assertions, it will like perfect place to do it. Maybe I don't know details. I haven't looked at source code. So. Yeah, uh, I'll move back to slides. So this was really intense. So what we looked at is Kotlin collections, lambdas, high order functions, no checked exceptions, data classes, nullable types, and this yet another framework for testing. So that's the joke. This is how you do SQL injection attack on speed cameras. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, I don't know details why I choose file. I don't hate it too much. I think that one of the reason for extension functions was to fix some language deficiencies in an extensible way. So I guess the, nobody thought file was that bad to completely rewrite it. Plus, lots of people are familiar. It's not as notorious as date. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, no, it's, it's not that much time now. So now we have choice. So we can do Kotlin puzzlers, which are not really puzzlers. There's like more pitfalls if you start learning Kotlin. Or we can do uh, tribute end and do snake. Or just like look at code. I'm not going to do any coding anymore. I'll just show quickly snake. So yeah, who, who votes for snake? And who votes for puzzlers? OK, so we're doing snake now. So yeah, this is my slide. This is like Andy. <laughs> so he, he did a whole session doing, uh, last year at you he did a whole session doing Snake in many languages, including Basic, which was amazing. There is a video <laughs> if you want to. And also there are like YouTube channel. And go somewhere. So yeah, here you go, Snake. Uh, yeah, I should run Snake first. That's definitely. So this Snake is done in Kotlin. It's not necessarily, yeah, you know, Snake game is like an old computer game, right? So this is blue thing is a snake. It walks around and red things are apples. So when snake eats an apple, it becomes longer. So the snake I implemented is kind of more involved because it can be reversed to this complicated code slightly. So you see there are many apples. So the goal of the game is eat as many apples as you can and survive. If you bump, if snake bites itself or bumps into a wall, the game is over. So I'm not doing anything. Snake bumps into a wall, game over. So that, that's the whole game. I assume most people played it. And so we're, we're going to look at source code for it. So I'll stop it. So in the first place, you want to have snake. Uh, I'll minimize this. And even before snake, we, I defined this data class called point. It has an x and y. It represents a point. It's data class, so it's immutable. I override string so that I can do things like this. So this point to string should equal and it's just sort of representation, right? So it's data class. Then we have enum class direction, left, up, down. This is similar to Java, you can define enums. Here we go to te snake tests. So I'll expand them one by one. So the first test, the snake is constructed with body as a list or can take a point. So here we have a snake. Snake really is, is just a list of points. This is how I represented it. So definition here at the bottom, I can make it slightly bigger. So again, snake is a mutable class. It takes a body of points. It's a list. So we can construct it with explicitly list, or we can have varag thing, which is just another syntax to, it's like Java varag. You can put arguments, and then I convert them here to list by calling constructor here, over here. Right, so it doesn't really matter. It's just syntactic sugar then snake can determine its direction from body points. This is the crucial thing about implementation is that it matters the sequence of points of snake. So the first point you put into snake, like here, it's the head of snake. 
And this is the second point. And if I zoom in here, this is, this is coordinate systems. This is start of coordinates. This is x goes, grows in the right and y grows down. So if we have snake head at 1, 1, and second part of snake at 1, 2, where it's like down, then direction is up because your head is up and so on. So this is how we can determine where snake is going. Then similarly, we, we know when snake bites itself. So we have snake 0.11 by itself should equal false. But here at the bottom we have snake, which basically contains 0.11 twice. So it's definitely biting itself. This is like basics with snake. Then we, snake can move. So we have snake and snake dot move left. It just shifts all the points left. So snake exists outside of any field. It's just a bunch of points. It can move around left, right. It becomes more complicated, like this is like vertical move, moves. So you see this is vertical snake. If we move it left, this is the head, big X, and this is the rest of the snake, so it moves left. This is like a bunch of assertions. It's a bit more complex for reversing snake. I'm not gonna go into it because it's not so exciting and bit too many details. So this is the public interface of snake, if you like. So this is data class, it has a body, and this is primary constructor at the same time. Then this is direction, which is body.direction, where direction is this extension function. Well, ignore this syntax. Basically, it's extension function on a list of points, and it decides if you move, if you move second point of snake in direction left, and this is equals to the first point, then you must be moving left. So it's basically if two by looking at the first two points of snake, you can figure out which direction it's moving. It doesn't matter. Then bite in itself if body contains, if body, if we make body unique and it's not the same size, then it might be bite, must be bite in itself. And a bit more involved direction, but all's going on here is like we're returning new snake and updating its body by moving in direction. So there are a bit more details, but the whole point, you have point extension function and point moves in direction, and when direction left, we move left, and so on. So just updating points. Uh, did it make sense? Yeah, R roughly makes sense. So it's basically three public functions. Direction, if snake bites itself, and just moving in some direction. So that, that's snake. Oops. Then there is game. Kotlin. So game, game test. So game can track when snake hits wall. So we have some object with width and height. This is it, and it has a snake. This is the test, so we have game. And then we update game on timer. So I, when I don't press any keys, snake keeps moving. That's the part of the challenge. So game, again, is a mutable thing. So when we update game on timer, we reassign it to game again. Here we have this thing apply which is, again, extension functions. It takes a closure here, and inside closure, this means snake. So this is another thing I didn't show. It's part of Kotlin standard library. It's extension functions to simplify syntax. If you know Groovy, this is with function. So it's just like syntactic thing to, I, I, could, have, I could write it like this, for example, game.state, game.snake, and so on. So this is just simplifying syntax here. So what it means, after we have this snake point one, one, zero, zero, we update it once on time and it moves left, and our state of the game we're playing. If we do update it again, our, our snake doesn't move and snake hit walls because it moved below zero. So that this is how game detects a snake moves. And then we game also detects when snake bites itself. So if we have this snake, this is the drawing of the snake. If you can see, this is its, oops, this is its head, and it's about to bite itself. If you move it in this direction up, it will bite itself. So this is what happens when we update game. One more step. And this is about bite. So game kind of tracks the state of snake. And snake grows after eating an apple. So here we have a game, five by five. There is a snake. And now we introduce apples, which is just in the direction of snake. And after the game moves one step, snake becomes bigger. So you see we have more points now. It was three, now it's four points here. And apples, they become empty. We had one apple, now all apples are gone. Next thing, new apples appear on timer update. 
So he will introduce apple factory <laughs> with random one, two, three. So this apple factory generates apples. So here I hard coded results that, so we start with what's going on here. We create a game, apples are empty. We do one step and then we get one apple added. And I hard coded this value for this random. So this random generator kind of passed in and I just hard coded the result for this particular, it's just purely random. And then Snake can also move up, up to this point. Game was always updated on timer. So it's like automatic update, apples appear. And here one more way to move Snake is to have user input. So here we have game and it's, it's basically simulating me pressing buttons. So when I press a button, Snake moves anyway. So after this, Snake just moves one round. So the, the, these are like, how game is used from outside. Does it, does it make sense? So here, like implementation of this, basically everything delegates to this method, which called update. So user updates and uh, user updates and timer updates that go to, to, to here. Then we create new apples, we create new snake based on direction. And then we check if snake hit wall, then we copy our game with state snake hits wall. This copy is defined for data classes. So this is the thing I, I mentioned. So you don't need to rewrite game and repeat all the arguments you get. You can just say the same object, but one field has changed. So similar with bit itself. Otherwise, we basically just create game with state playing and new snake and new apples. And this is that game updates itself in every tick. There is like a slight twist with Apple Factory. You can see Apple Factory no op, which means it will always return my empty set of apples. I'm not going to go into this just to save a bit of time. And that this is almost it. Now we can look at UI thing. Where is UI? Yes, in UI. Um, so th this is the main method. So we create games in UI and Games Win UI implements this interface. So it's an interface. It can be initialized with the listener. And this listener knows about game start, time, and user input. So this listener is really represents events which are coming from Swin thread. And on this Swin thread, this is our listener. And we game on game start, what we do, we create a new game assigned to this variable here and say, Game UI, paint this game for us, please. Then similar thing on timer. When timer comes into here, we, we check game state. Here, there is assumption that game start happens before on timer. So th this is kind of workflow that game start happens, we assign a game. Then un unless we're playing, we call this update game on timer, move on to the next state of the game and paint it. Similar thing for user input. So these are almost identical uh, calls. And then paint, paint game is just redraw game on Swing. So the thing is here is that everything happens on Swing UI thread because of callbacks. Can go and we could go and look at implementation of game UI, which will do lots of Swing things. And I'm not sure if it's worth it. It's it's all online. You can go into details. But that's the idea. If you look at main method, everything happens here. Uh, game is updated on each tick on each callback from UI thread. Hopefully it made at least some sense, gave overview of the structure. So everything is immutable up to this point. And here it's all mutation happens and it changes the whole game all the time. So this was Snake. I'll, I'll just move on because there isn't much time. So this was like, I guess, maybe confusing. So this is like the best protesting ever. <laughs> so yeah, and now Kotlin links just I'll quickly mention because if I can find slides, so there is a website Kotlin, Kotlin.link. It has references to everything you, you might want. And so just go there. There's obviously Kotlin Lang website brought by JetBrains. You can run any Kotlin code online. They have online uh, environment in which you can type code in the browser and just run it. And they, they will run on some backend. There is also Kotlin Cohen's, and this is a screenshot of Kotlin Cohen's, which is a bunch of exercises to do online if you want to learn the language. It's like really well done. And uh, also online, I did 99 problems in Kotlin. It's on GitHub. 
Uh, there is obviously Twitter account. There is Kotlin blog, which is quite good because they kept blogging all those six years. So if you go and read all the blog posts, it's interesting to see how things evolved. So it's quite exciting reading how language evolves. Also, there is Kotlin in action book. Like, happily, when I did screenshot, there was a blog post about this book. It's a decent book, so I, I read it. And it's like very hands-on, so don't, don't expect very deep uh, theoretical things in there. So there is also Kotlin Discuss, websites like a forum, and there is IRC. No, I'm joking, it's Slack. So <laughs> there, is no, there is IRC nobody uses. Slack is really nice, people are really helpful, and because Kotlin is not that big right now yet, hopefully yet, uh, you can just talk to developers. They will, act, like actual developers of language, they will help you, and it's like really good feedback. So what's the future of the Kotlin 1x releases? So there was release 1.1, and I think it introduced some performance problems. Uh, so, and so we're just waiting for it to be fixed, maybe also with plugin, and maybe add some minor features, well, not minor, but some features like array liter uh, list literals and so on. So there will be minor fixes this the next. Then there, there are core routines, which is experimental feature, and it's quite exciting. I, this is why I regret I missed the other session about coroutines in Python. So, but it's recorded, so I can watch it. And then there is experimental, another way more experimental thing is Kotlin native. So now there is JVM and JavaScript environments, and there is now in development compilation of Kotlin to native code. It's, it's still early stages, but it might be really interesting if it works out really well. So you could compile to, currently the idea is that there will be uh, in, in terms of GC, the, the biggest question, I guess, like if it's on JVM and JavaScript, you have GC. The, the question of how are you going to do it with native code and current answer, it will be pluggable, probably, maybe. So, yeah, this is the future. Yes, thank you, and there is feedback, please. If you want, there is server monkey. If you want to leave some feedback, it would be great. So, thank you.